um, I'm Christina Perez and welcome to this very first ever Latinx Kidlet Book Festival. You are at the um, Fantasy Myths and Legends panel. I am the author of the Sweet Black Waves trilogy and I'm very excited to be moderating this panel of amazing Latinx fantasy writers. Uh, first up, we have um, Zoraida Cordova, who is the author of a dozen novels, including the Brooklyn Bruja series and Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, A Crash of Fate. She is the co-host of the writing podcast Deadline City. Anna Mariano is the author of the middle grade um, <laughs> Love Sugar Magic trilogy and the upcoming YA novel, This Is How We Fly. She grew up in Houston and holds an MFA in creative writing from the New School in New York. Uh, L'Oreal Rion loves to write about science and magic. Her debut middle grade novel, Into the Tall, Tall Grass, was published in spring 2020. She's also a registered nurse and lives in New Mexico with her family. And Gabe Colnova is a trans masculine author who writes speculative fiction featuring marginalized characters grappling with identity. His upcoming book, The Wicked Bargain, will be published by Random House Kids in 2022. He is also the author of Beyond the Red uh, Trilogy, written under his former pseudonym, Ava J, and runs a popular writing-focused YouTube channel, Books is Pishy. Books, sorry. Book is, book is Pixie. I am having some speaking problems today. Um, okay, so um, just before I guess I get everyone to um, tell us about their books, um, I am just going to say that in the chat um, there is the anti-harassment policy, so please take a look at that. Uh, so let's start uh, with Zoraida. Please tell us about your latest endeavor. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm so glad to be here on the first ever Latinx Book Festival. Um, like Christina said, I'm Zoraida Cordova, and this year I had the brilliant idea of publishing four novels during a quarantine pandemic year. So that was fun. Um, <laughs> uh, the first book is Incendiary, which is a high fantasy in, in a world that is inspired by Inquisition Spain. It's about a group of people that have uh, magical powers. They're all sensory magic. Um, and the main character is a girl named Renata, who is a memory thief. Uh, and for, for her entire life, up until she was, well, her entire life, up until she was seven, she was used as a weapon by the king. Um, and now she escaped. She's like part of a band of rebels. And after her commander and the love of her life gets taken by the prince, she returns to um, the palace where she was held captive as a kid to exact revenge and, you know, do the thing. Uh, I'm also the author of the Brooklyn Bruja series, which ended this year with Wayward Witch. Um, I debuted my first middle grade, The Way to Rio Luna, which is a, a fairy tale novel. Um, and I wrote another book and I can't remember what it is, but it's <laughs> fine. Uh, uh, I co-edited Vampires Never Get Old with Natalie C. Parker. Uh, and that's that one is a fantastic collection of vampire short fiction from marginalized voices. So that's what I did this year. <laughs> and um, Anna, how about you? Have you been as busy? <laughs> uh, so three books this year, not four. Uh, but it was just weird timing. Uh, that's not normal for me. Uh, yeah, so I finished my Love Sugar Magic trilogy with Woo. book three. Woo. Uh, a mixture of mischief, which uh, finally had a villain, so that was fun to write. I... <laughs> I'm about to publish in December, This Is How We Fly, uh, my first young adult book about a team of Quidditch players. And I also did a Frankenstein retelling, or not retelling, um, Frankenstein adaptation summary for, for young readers through the Ghost Rider Apple TV show, Ooh, which I don't have cool. with me, unfortunately. <laughs> and L'Oreal? Hello, I'm L'Oreal Ryan. Um, my debut came out in April, height of the pandemic. Well, I guess we're at a new height now. Uh, <laughs> Into the Tall, Tall Grass. Um, it's about a 12-year-old girl who, let's see, everyone in her family has a magical trait except for her. Um, and she lives in the New Mexico desert with her family. Her grandmother is in a coma and sort of dying. And one day this magical, mysterious grass grows up in the desert. and Yolanda and her and her family end up going on this journey through the desert to try to save her grandmother's life. Um, it has a lot of STEM elements in it, um, a lot of magic. Everyone in the family has the you know the magical trait of 
best friends, ex-best friends, first crushes, a naughty little cute dog named after a scientist. Um, and yeah, that's basically what I did that. And I have two kids here who are in virtual school and we are just hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And Gabe, tell us a little bit about your books. Hi, as mentioned, I'm Gabe Coldnovoa, author of the Beyond the Red trilogy, which is a young adult sci-fi trilogy beginning with Beyond the Red, which is about an uprising on a distant alien planet that threatens the reign of a teen alien queen. I'm also of The Wicked Bargain, which is coming in 2022. It's a YA fantasy about a non-binary trans masculine pirate trying to survive the wreckage of their life in the aftermath of a devil deal gone terribly wrong <laughs> while hiding magic that could be their salvation or mean certain death. I have not released any books this year, so I feel like the slacker of the group here, but that's what I've been up to. <laughs> That sounds awesome. So um, let's. I have nothing for next year. It's fine. Um, <laughs> yes. No. Um, we'll just try to get through 2021. Um, so let's start by talking about the myths and legends that lay the foundations for your different books. Uh, what came first, uh, the legend or the plot? Um, Anna, let's start with you on this one. Ooh. Um, I don't know the answer to that though. Uh, <laughs> time to think well so my love sugar magic series um is based on i guess baking magic uh or it's not based on but it involves baking magic i didn't really talk about it uh when i was introducing it um and it's kind of brujeria but like very light on uh being realistic with like the practice of brujeria and a little more fantasy just like a fun magical power um, I worked on developing the concept of this series with Cake Literary. Um, so Danielle and Sona were um, the ones who kind of wanted to do practical magic, but middle grade in Texas. Um, so in that way, I mean, for me, like the plot came or the plot and the myth came together fully formed. Um, and then I just jumped in to like this exciting world that they were already picturing. Um, so like what I ended up doing was a lot of research on uh, spell, like magical properties of different things, mostly like things you could eat. Although also for book two, I uh, researched candles a lot, candle magic. Um, I found some really cool places. Like there's at least one magic shop in my neighborhood in Houston. Uh, there was a really cool online um, store that sells Velas in San Antonio, and they kind of like would talk you through what color you needed for different things. Um, so, and I think I, Candle Magic also features in Zoraida's books, right? If you want to jump in, <laughs> sort sort of, yeah. I mean, sort of. Uh, well, Anna, one of the things I love about your books is that, like, you're creating, you're basically making the practice of baking and and family traditions into a magical thing. Uh, and that's why I love I love your I, I always call it my yeah. brujitas because like you have like the baby brujitas and I have the the teenage uh, brujitas that do bad things. <laughs> zombie resurrections um, and, such. and so <laughs> absolutely zombie resurrections just a regular Tuesday <laughs> night. So the, the Brooklyn Brew House is a little different because I um there is no source, you know there's no there's no Wicca book written by Silver Raven Wolf uh, and published by Llewellyn, you know, uh, which is what I, which is what I read when I was a teenager. Me too. Um, there, you know, the the practice of of what is brujeria is is so different depending on the country and even within those countries, like regionally, what does it mean? Um, brujeria in Latin America, it, you know. I think that without without the indigenous practices and without the 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 practices from the slaves that were brought over to the Caribbean and South America, you know, without that, like, what what would it even look like, right? It would it would probably change because European European witchcraft is, is also uh, so much different, um, and also not based on science, right? Like, oh, she has a freckle, she's a witch, uh, and so when I was writing the Brooklyn Bruja series, I feel like I was tasked with creating my own, you know, myths and legends. I created a pantheon of gods that I modeled after the Greek pantheon. Um, I anthropomorphized feelings, and that's how I created my my god system. Um, 
I created my own spells and, and rituals and things like that. So there is no, I think that the things that I pulled from Latinx culture, specifically Ecuadorian, um, would be the aesthetics of it, right? And then the, the thing that, it, that makes it Latin or South American or whatever is the family aspect. So the, the real mundane stuff is what actually makes the Latinx, not the magic, because the magic is made up. Um, even though I feel that too. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that like when I get reviews from people out, that from outside cultures, no matter where they're from, they, they're sort of like, thank you for teaching me about your culture. And I'm like, it's, it's not real, <laughs> but, and, and I have an author's note in the back that says it's not real, but I don't think people read the author's notes. So there's something to say about that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the aesthetics of candles and, um, shells and, uh, bones and and whatever you know like every you know we have I have my own little altar that I travel with um, mm -hmm. because I've never in like it's like in, in like one of those little pouches from Ipsy that are that are cute and that I like <laughs> and so I, I put like my my sh my shell my Palo Santo my my stones I have a friend that gives me all kinds of stones um, and like and whatever's important so I, I make my own altars so there's no there's no guidebook to to any of this stuff but. Um, if it doesn't exist, you just, I'm, you know, you make it up as a writer. And, um, so Gabe, you're dealing with space, which I guess has fantasy myths and legends, but also science in it, but which came first for you, the plot or the sort of legends or, you know, ideas that you were drawing on? Um, well, I can actually talk about this more readily with The Wicked Bargain. Um, and so with The Wicked Bargain, I think it was a bit of both uh, because I knew that I wanted to write books about queer Latinx pirates, but <laughs> I had absolutely no plot. I was just like, that would be really cool. Um, and so as I um, did more research and I started familiarizing myself with myths and legends from Mexican and Cuban culture, um, I found a lot of stories around deals with the devil, which I thought was like super fascinating. And I was like realizing that, hey, you know, thematically a deal with the devil and pirates go like really well and I could definitely make that work. Um, and so thematically I, I was able to kind of weave the two together and the plot sort of came together out of that. And L'Oreal, was it the same for you or did you start with the legend and then find the plot? So I think, you know, what everyone's been saying is kind of making me feel better because I was thinking like, I don't think there was like a myth or a legend that I, you know, drew on. Um, and so it's kind of making me realize like, where, where did I even get this? And really like something that's always been really interesting to me is like immortality and, um, sort of like a scientific aspect of immortality. Um, and so like, I always knew I wanted to do something with that, with, you know, into the tall, tall grass, but then I have like a bicultural girl who is, you know, living with her primarily, you know, Mexican American grandparents, and everyone in their family has been called brujas in the whole, they're called that in the town as sort of a bad thing, but because they have these magical abilities. And so I was kind of like, how do I weave those two things together? I always knew the beginning, and I always knew the end, but I never knew how I was going to get there. Um, and so it's kind of, awesome to hear you guys all talk about this because I feel like it was like very similar process and like drawing from my life and drawing from my family um and what Zoraida said about like how it's very like the Latinx part is the family part and so like that just sort of I don't know that just sort of hit me on the head like duh that is what it was so um it was kind of like I don't know kind of a meld of the both of what I created and wanted to see um, so now, just sort of more generally, I want to ask all of you what drew you to writing fantasy among all the different genres. So I think I'll put Gabe in the hot seat first this time. <laughs> sure. Um, so I've loved fantasy since I was a kid. Um, and in adulthood, it's continued to remain one of my favorite genres. I think I never get bored of being able to make the impossible possible in the story, which is also the same reason I like writing sci-fi, is just making the impossible possible in different ways. Um, and so I just find it super fun to just spend endless hours creating and living in a world where anything you imagine can be possible. Um, and for me as a writer personally, I 
need to keep my own interest in order to actually commit myself to a book. And time and time again, where I've tried to write um, stories where there wasn't magic or there wasn't a fantastic element, I just couldn't keep my own interest. And I'd always be like, but what if magic? And then suddenly I'd be interested again. So I realized that um, fantasy is kind of just like what motivates me to write. I just really love being able to have that creative element. And Zoraida, what about you with fantasy and the magic? Is that also what sort of draws you to it, making things possible that are impossible? Yeah, I think I I I think I've always been sort of fascinated with what the endless possibilities of magical worlds can be. Whereas, you know, I grew up in in Queens, New York, and it's a cool place and the best borough, but it's also a little boring. Like I was always bored with with the real world. Um, and, and that's why I, I turned to fantasy to, to sort of feel, feel a connection to that magic. And I always wanted things like that to be real, right? As soon as I discovered Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Charmed, it was like over. So. <laughs> um, Anna, what about you? Yeah. Um, I definitely like, as a kid, really really wanted magic to be real i really i would wake up and test to see if i had developed telekinesis overnight you know trying to grab things from my bookshelf and stuff um and i i like to think that you know i did have magical powers it was just that it was writing and i didn't recognize it um as magic until much later but i also so i mean that's why i like to write fantasy is just because i think it's cool i think it's fun um but then i'm also really interested in like whenever you write magic, you're really writing about power. Um, and whatever you've put the magic into, you're looking at that thing and like giving it a certain amount of power or like analyzing the power that it already has um, or exaggerating the power that it, whatever it is. Um, so I really liked, I mean, I love the, the Love Sugar Magic series. You know, like I said, it wasn't my original uh, brainchild. It was Danielle and Sona's, but when they told me about it, I just was so into this idea that we could take the family, the air, like passing down um, traditions of Mexican American family, and make that the power that you have. Um, and that's really what tries tries to come in through the whole series is that like really being excited and celebrating the power that we have. And your your upcoming YA, I remember you talking about it a couple of years ago, and it's your sort of love letter to Quidditch, yeah. right? Yeah, so it's not magical. Uh, no magic, contemporary mm -hmm. YA, uh, but it, it has to do with the way that you feel when you, um, you know, join a community and how there's a little bit of magic in that, joining a community that really accepts you and, and you feel at home in. Um, and again, that's a type of power, too. Definitely. Um, L'Oreal, what about you? What kinds of, um, you know, what drew you to the sort of the fantasy and like the, the power that you decided to imbue in the different um, systems in your book? So, I mean, I, I agree with kind of what everyone was saying in that, you know, there is something really cool about being able to go into a world where anything is possible. Um, you know, especially, I don't know, especially for kids, right? So kids, they are living in all sorts of different situations in different um, different schools, different lives. And that escapism of fantasy is such a great place for people and readers to be able to go, um, maybe to escape their real life, maybe to explore some stuff that they want to think about. Um, but it's pretty cool that you can basically create a rule, a world with any rules. Um, there's just something really neat about that. You can write yourself into a corner and to a giant plot hole or something, you know, if you don't do it right, uh, which, you know, I've never done. Uh, but it's just, it's pretty amazing that there is no limit to any of it. You can just go and, and that people and readers will still connect to those worlds in some way is pretty awesome. So that sort of leads on um, to my next question. And we've already, you guys have already sort of touched about this a bit um, in terms of how important your culture and identity is in your writing process and whether you've had any doubts um, along the way in including or excluding your cultural identity in your writing and, and why. So I think I will um, ask Zoraida to comment on that one first. <laughs> 
Sure. I think that I have, so I have, it's kind of, I'm trying to find the shortest path to the story. Uh, when I queried my first novel, I, I was um, 18. Um, I would, my, I went out with my first novel with an agent. I was 18. Um, and that novel was a contemporary book. It was a quinceanera. Um, and that one didn't sell. And a lot of the, and I was, I understand why, like it was, it was too long for a contemporary, too many characters. But the, the thing that we got was like, oh, this is really funny. Um, and, and even though there are a lot of characters, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we already have a Latino book for the season. So it wasn't even that my book was bad uh, because a book can be edited, right? Like I've seen books acquired that need help, but it, an editor has a vision and they can shape your book, right? Like they see your clay monster and they're like, all right, let's just, uh, we're, I don't know how clay works. Like, let's just fix this out. Um, and, and, and so it, that led me to, to thinking like, okay, great. So I can't publish this. I'm gonna write something completely different. So I didn't write for a whole year because I was like, oh my God, my life is over. I'm 19 and I'm not published uh, because I was the dramatic person I still am, um, just a teenager, right? <laughs> the end of a teenager. Um, and so then I, did, I wrote The Vicious Deep, which was about a teen merman, who, a teen boy who discovers he, he's a merman and has this like merman legacy. Uh, and his mom was essentially a little mermaid, but he was white. And so I, I did exclude, you know, I didn't exclude people of colors from the main characters because I, I had like, you know, his love interest was, she was half Ecuadorian and his friend group was all, you know, pretty diverse. But at the same time, I felt like I couldn't make it fully what I wanted, like what the communities that I grew up in, I, I sort of um, whitewashed that a little bit because I thought that that's what I needed to do to get a step in the door. But it was also, you know, the year 2010 um, and my book came out in 2012, right? So two years later, we had this like little revolution with we didn't need diverse books in the, in the publishing industry. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, I can do this, right? It's just, we just have to hold publishers accountable. So long story to say, yes, I did that. Um, and a lot of a lot of authors of color did that. Um, you know, they they wrote from from with from places outside of their culture because they needed to. They it was almost the only way to get published during that period of time from a big publisher and from without having to be relegated to like, oh, you have to self publish to write X Y Z. And there's a big there's a bigger discussion about this. Like, it's not it's not as simple as saying like, well, gonna write white characters now. You know, that's not that's not the simple answer. It's, it was just one way that we found. Now I just write whatever I want and I write the, the, I write my own truth, right? As I see it. And that's always going to be, it's always going to look a certain way. So. And L'Oreal, how did you find your way into including your um, cultural identity in your works? So I think I still am finding my way. Um, I, when I first started writing, um, I, I think I just, I'm trying to think, I think everyone was pretty white, um, which I'm pretty white. That was like the joke in the family, right? Um, and so, but being like bicultural was never anything I had even read in a book before. Um, now there's a lot more and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so great. It's like seeing all of these, uh, all the, you know, representation from literally like any bicultural character. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can so relate to that even if I don't relate to either of the cultures. Um, and so for me, it was like, just when I started Into the Tall Tall Grass, I was like, what if I just kind of put my family in there? Not necessarily my family as the characters, but like my upbringing, um, like the dad who's white and in the military and then the grandma, you know, who is Mexican American and like, how would all of that work? And so I just kind of decided to just give it a chance and do it. Um, with a million doubts along the way of, you know, my Spanish sucks. We were not allowed to, you know, we were not taught Spanish, but it was my, my grandparents didn't want us to speak Spanish. I um, didn't want her, you know, my mother to speak Spanish. And so I'm like, can I even put Spanish in my book? Is that okay? Cause I grew up hearing it, but I don't speak it. So what if I make a mistake or, um, you know, am I enough? to write this? It, am I trying to stretch myself too far? Is this unfair? Um, and so I've 
I'm still figuring those things out and I'm still grappling with it. And actually like being a part of Lusas and the Latinx Kid Lit Book Fest is, is like helping me sort of find my way um, and where, where, where I can, where I fit in the whole like Latinx community. No, I, I can certainly relate to that. Uh, Gabe, how about you? Yeah, um, I think I definitely relate to a lot of what L'Oreal just said. Um, I think I started writing so when I was like 13, and that was when I like was had decided I wanted to be a published author. And at the time, the only books I'd ever seen featuring Latinx characters were always issue books about being Latinx or um, about being undocumented, that sort of thing. And so I, it had not occurred to me that I was even possible to write like a fantasy with Latinx characters. Like that did not exist in my mind as like even an option. And so it wasn't until, you know, like a decade later, essentially that, you know, I started seeing we need diverse books and things started actually exploding in terms of like exploring cultures. And it wasn't just issue books that I was like, oh, wait a minute, like this is something I can do. Like this is something I can really explore. Um, and so that was really exciting to me. But at the same time, um, even though my culture and identity has become increasingly important for me to include in my work, I've also definitely struggled with doubts about it in terms of, you know, this the notion of being Latinx enough, like L'Oreal mentioned, um, which I recognize logically isn't actually a thing, um, but can be very difficult to shake. And I think sometimes it can feel hard um, to not feel like an outsider in your own cultural background. And that can definitely come into play when you're writing and in terms of imposter syndrome and you know those self-doubts. So that's something that I continue to work on and continue to push myself with. But I, I think it's a process and I think it takes a lot of, <laughs> a lot of um, you know, doing events like this and listening to other people and realizing that your experience isn't just your experience and there are other people who feel the same way you do. And that all kind of brings me back to community and feeling a part of again. No, for sure. I think this is an amazing event um, for all of us. Um, and Anna, I know you've talked a little bit about, um, you know, Love, Sugar, Magic, but how does does your identity feature in um, the, um, how, uh, sorry, how we can fly? Um, like, I, I'm really excited for your Quidditch book. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, I actually wanted to talk about two of them, and I'm not I'm not super proud of this story, but I, when I was writing, uh, this is how we fly. I tried to write outside my lane with my main character, first person point of view, very close. Like, this is my experience. This is my identity story. Um, I tried to write a, like uh, an Asian main character, um, biracial Chinese and Irish, um, and it was not a good idea. But the reason that I like at the time felt like I wanted to do it, I think, is because I was scared of working through these issues that I was having with my identity and all of my like existential feelings and this whole story that was like really close, close to my heart and close to my life and not, you know, definitely fictional. But like, I was afraid that people were going to look at it and be like, oh, yeah, this is Anna. Um, so I think that was like my, I was like, oh, I have this solution. I will like put some distance between myself and the main character. Uh, that wasn't a good plan. <laughs> that was not, and luckily I had a, a good sensitivity reader who was able to, you know, very uh, nicely explain like, hey, so you're working through all these problems, right? And those are realistic problems. And you're missing all the joy that comes with these cultures. And I was like, oh, you mean the whole thing I wrote an entire series about? Yeah, you're right. I don't have that uh, in this book. <laughs> So that that comment was just so important for me to hear. Um, luckily, in time, I heard it in time and was able to rewrite the book. And um, the Ellen that I ended up with is such a like I don't know. I'm just so I'm so happy with the way it turned out. I'm so grateful to people who were able to tell me why I needed to do that. But also that process of changing things to be more closer to my experience was like kind of painful. Um, it was like we've all been saying a little scary, uh, a little. You know, you have to be vulnerable to write at any point. Um, but when someone has specifically told you, like, your character has too much pain and not enough joy, put them, make them closer to yourself. Like, there's, you know, you're really digging into some some experiences there. Um, so, yeah, that was like a whole. <laughs> and anyway, I mean, I think it was a good lesson. I think that the book is stronger for it. Um, I have some scenes now that just like make me laugh when I read them because I'm like, oh yeah. 
<laughs> Somebody said that to me. Um, well, that I mean, that actually sort of dovetails with the, the question I was going to sort of throw out there um, to all of you next, which is more about sort of how your personal journey has influenced the development of your character's journeys. Um, and, you know, not just in terms of cultural identity, but other things that you've sort of gone through in your life. So let me throw that one back to Zoraida. You have a lot of different characters to choose from on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I stay very separate from my characters. I don't, you know, I don't write, I don't think I've written any character that is close to me. I ha I well, I do have an adult novel coming out next year, which I haven't announced it, but I, we might announce it by the time this festival comes out. So whatever, I'll just talk about it anyway. It's magical realism and it's about, it's, but it, the, the, again, the character is like third generation. I was born and raised, I was born and raised in Ecuador. So like, I don't have any, I don't have any cultural anxieties, right? Like I, I, I don't have the feeling of like not being, I have a feeling of longing and like sadness that I'm not, I can't be home a lot, but, um, or a, a part of home a lot. But um, other than my characters being like, hot messes, I think that that would be the closest that I will get to a character being like me. Um, yeah, I'll just stick with that. In the hot seat on that one, um, maybe L'Oreal? Sure, so uh, my main character, Yolanda, she's a bit of a grouch, um, which my sister would definitely say was me for sure growing up. Um, and so, yeah, I, I wrote her kind of like, kind of how I was, we're not exactly the same, but similar. And she, I was kind of grouchy until I think I was about 18 and I left home. Um, and I kind of wanted to give her the opportunity to change before that. Um, and she, you know, she, she's very kind of stubborn and set in her ways and grouchy and she thinks everyone's kind of against her. and. Um, I kind of wanted her to be able to learn that the lesson that maybe that's not true uh, by the end. And so that's, that's kind of what I did. I wanted, she basically ends up sort of learning that, you know, no matter what boxes you've put yourself in, no matter what everyone says you are, you always have the capacity to grow and change and become a different person, you know, or a better person, if that's what you want to be. And so I think that was, that was something I took a while to learn. <laughs> I think we can all be still learning that one sometimes. Um, Gabe, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, so the Wicked Bargain is very much about self-acceptance and found family and the toll it takes to hide who you are. Um, and so I came out as trans when I was 26 after years of living in a toxic household where I had to stay closeted. So I've experienced all of those things firsthand. Um, and it's become more and more important to me to include those things because those themes um, really allow me to feel a deep connection to the characters who also go through it themselves. And it feels important to me to also write these things because you know I know there are other people who are going through it too and there are other teens who have experienced it as well. And so my identity has increasingly become something that I've woven into my characters, both because you know it feels freeing to finally be able to write characters who are like me um, openly um, but also because it just feels increasingly important to me as I, you know, continue with my transition and become, you know, more open about who I am and really feel all the benefits and wonderful parts of it. You know, it makes me want to even more include more characters who are like that and who get to experience that joy, um, but also experience the hardship that comes with it. So. No, that's a great note um, to sort of end on for this portion before we go on to the student questions. Um, so I'm going to the, those questions and sort of videos from um, students around the world, uh, or the US at least. Um, so the first one um, for you all is from Raina S. And she is a fifth grader in California. And I think the video is um, going to come up in a second. Um, for you all to see. Oh. My name is Raina. I have a question. When writing a myth or legend, is it easy to come up with fantasies that inspire some people? Um, who wants to jump in first on that one? Raise your hand. <laughs> Anna. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, that's, I was like, no, it's not easy. Um, 
but I think it's fun. So there's a there's a trade off. And that's how I feel about writing in general. It's not easy, but it's fun. And L'Oreal? I would agree. It's definitely not easy. Um, and it takes it takes more like longer than I would hope sometimes. Sometimes you have to sit on it and think about it for a long time before things make sense. Um, but yeah, it's not definitely not easy, but fun. I would agree. Zoraida, how about you? I think that for me, it's a little bit easy to come up with the things that I wish I could see. So if a myth or legend that I really want doesn't exist, then I think that my job as a writer is to create my own versions. And that's, that's, why I've written all the books that I've written because they didn't exist and I wanted to see them on the shelves. Um, and I, I, I still get inspired by myths and legends. Like I'm a big, big uh, lover of the Greek myths and legends, um, but I'm starting to do more research on other cultures too, um, just, to, just to familiarize myself with them. And Oh, sorry, you were muted. I think you were telling me to talk, hopefully. Um, so <laughs> yes, I was telling you to talk, sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, you know, I generally agree with everyone else. It's not easy, but it is fun. I kind of see it the same way as writing any fantasy novel, though. I think um, writing fantasy that is captivating and brings something memorable to the table is always hard to come up with because the very limitless nature of fantasy where anything you come up with um, can be part of this book also means that you have to like, you know, come up with it. <laughs> so, so I think um, that can often be daunting because you feel like you're not only looking at a white page, but it's like this blank void of like endless possibilities and you have to decide like, okay, um, what do I want to pull from that? What do I want to create? And, and then actually push your imagination to get there. So. Excellent. So we have our next um, student question coming up. Another uh, video from Corbin G, an eighth grader in California. So Corbin let's see Georges, what. And I was wondering if you have to do research to learn more about the myths and legends. Zoraida. <laughs> Hi, Corbin. Um, I do have to do more research. When I'm looking at other legends uh, outside of the ones that I've created, I do do research because I think that for me, knowledge is really important. Um, and sometimes when you, when you don't know enough about other cultures, it feels like you're inventing something new. And that's not always true, right? Like sometimes we feel like, oh, a mermaid finds, falls in love with a boy on land. Wow, that's such a great idea. And then you realize, oh, somebody else Hans Christian Andersen already beat me to that, right? Um, so it's, you know, in order for us to really try to create new things, we have to know what existed already. Uh, and then we can go forth and like write our own versions. Anna, how about you? What kind of research did you do? Uh, I had the best research ever for my Love Your Magic series because I just got to eat lots and lots of pan dulce. Uh, just go to all the bakeries and even like, you know, as Zoraida was mentioning, even not just the panaderias, not just the Mexican bakeries, but like all the different bakeries, just any any sweet food I had to eat, right? It was part of my research. Uh, but um, I also wanted to mention that in my third book, we kind of came up with this idea of putting duendes in, and duendes are like an actual mythical figure. Um, kind of. They're, it's like another word for dwarves or goblins or hobgob like you know it's kind of like a big category it's like little magical small people uh and so i was trying to research uh and i kind of ran into the thing that that's right has been talking about a lot where there's certainly stories and myths and like they steal they'll steal your toes and like you know they creep around your house uh but like there was not there's not like a one unified idea of what a duende looks like or what you know how they get all these different things these details so i ended up picking like just something that to me felt kind of like really out there. I was like, oh my gosh, they're gonna be cat goblins. Like, uh, and it's it's not that I saw that anywhere. It was just that everything I saw was so diverse that I was just like, whatever, I'm just gonna like put my own spin on it. Um, and I think cats are kind of goblins anyway, aren't they? They are. Uh, so like, you know, it is, I think it's finding out what there is, finding out like where the boundaries are, if there are any, you know, I didn't wouldn't have wanted to write a duende who was like, transforming into an owl, because that's a whole different thing. Um, I mean, maybe I would now I want to do that crossover. But 
like <laughs> knowing what they're doing all the research and then still knowing that you get to make the ultimate call. Gabe, what kind of research did you do on the devil's deals? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, once I realized that there was a common theme, I did read a whole bunch of them to be like, are there any other unifying themes? And then um, I didn't find that there was like, you know, the same kind of deal over and over again. It, they just all ended tragically, usually. <laughs> um, so I, I think it was honestly very similar to what Anand's write up said, which is, you know, getting to know what's out there and then from there, putting your own spin on it, whatever that means, whether it's creating cat goblins, as Anna said, or just creating a certain um, deal in like devil demon hierarchy that works for the fantasy that I wanted. Um, so I think it is important absolutely to do the research first so you know what's out there and also so you can be inspired by things. Um, but also, you know, once you have that foundation, um, the fun part is being able to put yourself into it. And L'Oreal, what, um, what have in your research inspired you? So um, yeah, I would like second everyone else, what everyone else said too about you do have to do research um, because yeah, sometimes you don't even realize some of the things that have made their way into your subconscious and then you start processing it and you go, wait, I think I knew that from a long time ago. And so like, for example, um, in mine, like Tuck Everlasting was like one of the classics I read um, as a child and it's one, I'm not a huge fan of a lot of classics, but it, they, I just had trouble connecting with them. But for this one has like been with me since the beginning. And I realized like, oh, you're kind of writing something kind of similar to that with this, you know, this take on immortality. Um, but I wanted to, it to be sort of modern and more scientific, I guess, in a way. So I ended up doing a lot of research into, <laughs> I went deep into like DNA and carbon and um, immortality. And like none of that really makes it into the book, but it kind of frames the, it's the framework of the book. So like there is an entire familial pedigree of genetics underneath the book. There is this whole theory I have underneath of carbon and returning carbon to the earth. And that is kind of what flourishes life. And, but none of that is like explicitly stated in the book. It's just sort of, in the symbolism underneath. But it's kind of strange because it's science, sort of, but kind of thrown out there a little bit deeper than that. Well, <laughs> science gets to be magic at a certain point, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, science is magic. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, so we have our final student question um, that's about to come up. Um, and this one, I'm just going to read. There's no video. If you could reread any story or series again for the first time, what would it be? Um, that's what Victoria K. from a fifth grade in California wants to know. Um, so, Gabe, do you want to take that one first? Sure. I thought a lot about this one, um, but I think what I settled on is uh, Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo, because I'll always remember that first time reading it where not only was it incredible to be able to jump back into a world that I really loved through um, Shadow and Bone, but I got to learn all sorts of new things about it and you know visit different parts of the world and meet new characters in that world. And then it had this really fascinating heist thing, which was so fun to read and it was just really cleverly written. And I was surprised like so often reading that. And I know that rereading it has also been fun, but being able to reread it for the first time where I don't know what happens um, would be really, really great. <laughs> And Anna, how about you? So uh, I'm going to cheat and actually say that I don't think I would do that. Um, I struggled with this question also. I was like thinking through. But I just really like improve as a rereader. Um, I, from, and from, since I was very young, I would always reread books that I liked over and over and over. Um, it's and I do this now with TV shows as well because I'm just really like the first time I'm watching something or reading something I'm really stressed out like I'm anxious and I'm nervous and I just a lot of times I skip really important things uh my reading comprehension is also like you know I'm like a slow reader at, and then I get excited and I become a fast but bad reader uh not bad but you know uh <laughs> so like I've just I've had that as like part of my reading life forever so the books that I love, I love them because I reread them. I love them because on the fourth or fifth time, 
I finally figured out what that character's name was because I'd been saying it wrong the whole time. Or on the 20th time, uh, Ellie Enchanted shout out here, I finally realized why the coins are called KJs because the king is King Gerald. It probably has his face on it. Oh. Uh, so eh. <laughs> this is very, yeah, minute details. I like that. And so I don't think if I, you know, if I have a book series that I love, I don't actually want to erase that memory of it because what I love is building those layers and then I think that helped me become a better writer who can like think about putting those layers into my own books. Zoraida, do you like to reread? I do like to reread and I reread often. I, I actually, with this question, I realized I don't read a lot of series. I think I've read duologies for the most part. Um, but rereading, so the one series that I reread a lot, which I, I came to it late. I didn't read Percy Jackson until like 2016. Or fifteen, because I wanted to finish my my own like Poseidon, you know, pr uh, Merman Prince series first before I got into that. Um, if I could reread a book, though, um, it would probably be White Cat by Holly Black and have that initial feeling, because that series it's about like a mob, like a magical mob, and people with like different kinds of powers, um, and the twists in that in those books are so artful that I feel like part of me has been trying to write a twist that's that good for a long time. That or perhaps um, the the first, so last year, uh, two, maybe was it two years ago, the the, um, the Wicked King by, also by, literally I just wanna reread Holly Black books for the first time, like if I could get that feeling back because she's just so tricksy at what she does and um i really like the ending of the wicked king just punched me in the throat and i was like thank you yeah <laughs> and uh l'oreal what about you oh my god that was really funny um so you know this was it was kind of a tough question i re i used to reread a lot as a kid and i don't know that i do it as much now mostly because i don't have a ton of time i've been doing a lot of audiobooks um because sitting down and reading i've been like too stressed over the last year so audiobooks have been good um but i did just read um cemetery boys by aiden thomas and i loved it it was so good i know i have it right here too i have it right here it's so good um I just, it was like the first book I've read in a while, probably most of the year that I just felt fully immersed in. I loved every single thing about it. I loved the characters. I loved the families. I loved the imagery. Um, and I kind of sad I already read it because I kind of want to read it again <laughs> for the first time. So that's what I would recommend. I did actually think of one if it's not too late. <laughs> Sorry, because I realized I was, I was, you know, that had been my answer that I planned, but I realized that I have a, a really good writing friend who wrote a book, um, the, A River of Royal Blood by Amanda Joy. And because I was in workshop with her from the very, very, very first prologue of that book, when I sat down to read the final copy, I was like, this is so good and it's so amazing. But I was also seeing all the changes that had happened. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I know, you know, this character's dead. <gasps> this character's alive? What's going on? Oh, there, there, there it is. There it is, they're dead now. Uh, <laughs> so, um, that one, I actually, I think I would have liked, I would like to read it from the first time with no expectations from the beginning. Sorry, I just thought of that. <laughs> well, we have some excellent um, recs for everyone's uh, TBR piles, uh, and we have reached the end of the hour. It has sort of flown by. Um, thank you so much uh, to Anna Zoraida, Gabe, and L'Oreal for um, sharing all of your amazing knowledge about myths, fantasy myths and legends on this fantasy myths and legends panel. Um, if you all have a copy of your books, you can, um, you know, sort of wave it at the audience here. Um, and thank you everybody um, for, for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed this panel and that you will attend other ones during this amazing festival weekend. Thank you, bye-bye.